I'm Joe Bruckner. I'm at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. And I'm speaking with uh, Mr. Russell Richardson, who is going to give us his experiences during World War II as part of the Veterans History Project. Mr. Richardson, I first want to thank you for coming today. It's an honor for me to be able to talk with you and hear your experiences in the Atlanta History Center and the library. Thank you. I appreciate it, too. Glad to do it. I must admit, I'm getting a little nervous about the whole thing. Well, there's nothing to be nervous about, <laughs> right. I promise you. <laughs> you know your story better than anybody. Yeah. So, what we're going to do today is, is talk about a little bit about your upbringing and your experiences in World War II, your training. Mm -hmm. Uh, your experiences overseas, and as you know, this will be put into the Library of Congress and also in the Atlanta History Center so that uh, generations that come after us can, can know your story. And we really mm. appreciate you doing this. Would you state your name and, and when you were born? It's Russell H. Richardson. People call me Russ. I was born uh, November the 1st, 1923 in Clarksville, Tennessee. Uh, I think I was one of the first in my family to be born in a hospital. <laughs> but uh, I had uh, two sisters that lived, and my father died when I was six, and uh, my mother raised me. And, uh, we stayed in Clarksville, Tennessee until about 1939 or 40, and then moved to Jacksonville, Illinois, to live with my sister and her husband and family. And that's where I enlisted. Uh, I'd finished high school in Jacksonville, Illinois and uh, was one of the few rebels living in Jacksonville, and the kids in the school always called me Tennessee. But uh, I'd started working, well, I arrived out of high school, I worked for Sears for Montgomery Ward, and uh, was helping to form a union of retail clerks, and uh, when the manager found out about it, he called us all together, and after the meeting, he said, Russ, I need to see you. And he said, have you ever been up in the attic? And I know. He said, well, I want you to go up and work in the attic and dust off all the dummies and the glass cases. And, and uh, of course, he said, what you're doing, uh, Avery will shut this store down before he'd submit to a union. So that was one of my first uh, social active uh, activity things, I think. And after two or three days up there, the electrician working, and he asked me what in the world I was doing up in that hot, dusty, nasty place. And I told him, and of course he was, even though he was a management person, he was very strong for unions, so he said, come on over and work with me. So I started in on apprenticeship for electrician in early summer, and uh, was really learning a lot because he was a good teacher. But after a while, it was hard to get any supply. That was in uh, the summer of 41. And even though we weren't in the war, it was hard to get equipment and things. So I spent a lot of time just wiring uh, fluorescent fixtures like these up here and instead of doing the electrician's work. And uh, after a while, it was just really dragging. I wasn't having much to do in work at the electric place. So uh, I stopped by the uh, recruiting office and I got the old recruiting sergeant's line of gab. He said, well, you know, Russ, if you go in right now, I could give you any branch of the service you want and any school you want. And that sounded good, so that's what I did. I signed up, my mother signed for me. And uh, I went to, I don't know, it was camp, some camp up in Illinois, near Kankakee or up in a way. Uh, and one of my classmates asked me if I'd delay for a few days, and he, he didn't enlist with me. So we went to there and got our uniform and all our tests and that kind of stuff. And then they shipped us to Biloxi, Mississippi, uh, to Keesler Field. And Keesler Field was still under construction. And to this day, when my wife does the laundry and pours bleach in there, it smells like Keesler Field to me. <laughs> Uh, because the, the bathrooms weren't finished in the barracks and stuff. And uh, the drill field was soft sand about a foot deep. So it was quite a workout just to go through drills. What were you being trained to do at Keystone? Uh, well, at that time, that was basic training at Keystone Field then. And uh, we had barracks and kitchens, but they weren't really finished. And uh, I can remember to this day the uh, guy, the sergeant that was in charge of the barracks that I was in, and you felt like he could make the trees bend when he yelled out. He had the loudest voice I have ever heard. And uh, it was, I was there when Pearl Harbor hit, and uh, 
took a lot of teasing because I was one of the youngest in the outfit and uh, took a lot of tests, took case to feel <coughs> qualified <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> for radio school. And so after a few months, a very short time at Keystone Field, was sent to Scott Field, Illinois, for radio school. And of course, by that time, we were on war footing, and they were going to classes uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So I started in there to radio school. And after a few weeks, I realized I might become an operator, but I didn't think I'd be a mechanic and an operator. Some of the theory and mathematics was just getting ahead of me. So I concentrated on learning Morse code and theory of operations and that kind of stuff. And uh, learned weather uh, reporting. Never used it, but uh, at least I learned what clouds looked like and that kind of stuff. And uh, so after graduation from radio school, it must have been in uh, early May of 42, I was a, I'd been offered a chance to go to officer's candidate school, but I was just barely 18, and I thought, I'm too young to be telling others what to do. So I turned that down. I really didn't think I was all that smart anyhow, but I'd qualified. So I went on, graduated from radio school, and was assigned to a fighter group, a 31st fighter group, which at that time was stationed outside of New Orleans, uh, Louisiana. And I, mean, I was really disappointed because I wanted to get into the war. And I thought they'd be down there on patrol forevermore with the fighter group. And uh, how wrong I was. As soon as I got off the train and the truck that brought me out to the camp, I was told to go draw my overseas equipment that we were leaving. And uh, I can remember very sentimentally, I had about 50 cents in my pocket of cash. And we went over to ship my personal belongings uh, back home because I had an iron for my clothes and a bunch of trip trap that you didn't really need, but it was personal stuff that I shipped home. And after I'd shipped it, I can remember uh, putting in a, a nickel to get a cocoa. And it came back. That was the best nickel I ever saw. I can remember that cocoa to this day. Cause I mean, I was flat broke, didn't know anybody in the outfit, and uh, knew we were getting all corralled to go overseas. They lined us up for a bunch of sh shots and things, and uh, went from uh, that pl place, whatever the name of the base was, to uh, New Jersey. And uh, I'm gonna slow down. I'm getting dizzy. Turn off for a, a Fort Dix, New Jersey maybe. I can't remember the name for sure, but that, I'm pretty sure that's it. And we were there for a few days, and then they put us on a train to New York and boarded the Queen Elizabeth. And, uh, Did you know where you were gonna go? When you got vaguely, but not to the day. Let me back you up yeah. just a minute and ask you something about when you were at Keesler yeah. and Pearl Harbor was attacked. What were you doing when you heard that? Well, there were a bunch of us gathered in this little radio room, uh, listening to the radio, and uh, couldn't believe what was happening. And uh, everybody was all excited because they thought, boy, now we're really in the war. We knew it was imminent, so sort because of, of what we were there training for, and drilling, and going to radio school, and all that stuff. Uh, so it was kind of exciting and made you angry to think what was happening and uh, worried about the guys that were in Pearl Harbor and uh, that kind of stuff. It was a very dramatic day, uh, but one that kind of made you feel like you were brought together with your, your buddies. Did you talk to your mother that day or the next day? No, I can't remember if I did. I may well have, but... Uh, was there a different attitude about training after that? I mean, what do you do now, now we're in the war? I guess it's a little bit more serious. And, and certainly the drill sergeants were more serious. <laughs> and the same thing when we got to radio school at Scott Field. It was a real seriousness now. I remember one incident in the barracks hall that stayed with me. Uh, there was one Japanese fellow in there. And everybody liked him. He was very pleasant. And all of a sudden, well, he disappeared. And of course, we found out that his folks had been put in an internment camp, and he'd been shipped out for something else and taken out of radio school. You know, it was part of the history at the time. And uh, if you were Japanese, you were in trouble. I subsequently had some Japanese buddies that had been in the group that was in Italy that were cited, made ordinary citizens of Texas. 
because uh, they had saved the Texas battalion somewhere up in the uh, Alps or someplace in, in Italy. And uh, Sam Rashida was one heck of a soldier. He and his twin brother uh, had fought there. And their folks had been in, put in the internment camp, but they weren't so bitter about it, or at least they didn't express it. And he was a very good friend of mine. Did he make it through the war? Oh, yeah. Good. Now, we did find out what happened to that Japanese boy that was in the barracks with us. So, so you're getting shipped off for Fort Dix. Fort Dix, yeah, on Queen Elizabeth. Uh, we thought that was really something. Of course, they put us in this little hole way down in the, I don't know how many feet below the water we were, and uh, there was about six or eight of us in this little bitty six by eight cabin, it seemed like. So I volunteered for water duty and uh, to get out of that hole. And it wasn't long before I was up there and, and one of the British crew came by and he said, you're sitting right over the ship's crew. Let me get a cushion for you so you don't get sick. Well, that cushion just made it enough that I did get sick. You weren't supposed to get sick on the Queen, but, but I did. <laughs> and uh, it was quite an experience going on that. And that, that the Queen had just dropped off a bunch of prisoners of war, Germans, in Australia, and then come back to New York to take a bus over on the Queen. We had our own bunk. Later on, I'm told the Queen had what they call hot beds. You had a bed that you could sleep in for so many hours, and you had to get up and make room for somebody else. I'm glad I wasn't on the Queen when it was that crowded. Yeah. Was it all soldiers on the, on the Queen? Oh, yeah. There? It was all, mostly Air Force, uh, I guess some infantry. It was the first group, see, that was in June of 42, one of the first groups to go to England uh, during the war. There might have been some infantry over there, but uh, one of the things that kind of interests me was our outfit, our pilots had had P-40s. And they decided, I think, at the last minute, that it was too dangerous to fly the P-40s across and land in Greenland or Iceland or, and into England. So they put the pilots on destroyers so they'd get there about the same time we did, shipped us to England, and trans had the guys train in Spitfires. So you, you <coughs> shipped from Fort Dix to England? Right. We landed at uh, Greenock, Scotland. Uh, Greenock or Greenock, uh, and I... Uh, I didn't go back, I did go back to uh, Glasgow and, and those places but a few years ago with my wife. But uh, we were then we trained there, at, we landed, and I remember I got me on a train and they gave us a box, box lunch. And uh, I thought, oh boy, that, that really looks good, it's like a pie. Well, that was a mutton pie. And well, I, I can remember to this day, biting into that thing and smelling that billy goat. But anyway, we landed and- Did you like it? No, was, at that time I was hungry enough to eat anything. Uh, we went, they landed us at uh, Chichester, up in the northern part, and trained there. We trained in British radio and that kind of stuff. And I remember the first night, it was a, we had been taken, we had taken over some Neeson huts that had been British uh, airmen. And one guy came in about 10 o'clock, not knowing, thinking it was still his barracks. And he came in and he told us, he, he said, he started telling us all the war stories about how you'd know if it was a German plane flying over. If it was a German plane, it would go, because they didn't have the engine synchronized like most of ours. And he had hardly left, and I heard this airplane going over. So that was my first shock to the war. <laughs> Nothing happened. That plane was looking for some factory in North uh, in England. Anyhow, we stayed there for a few months, or weeks really, and got trained and acclimated to British rations and tea and stuff. I don't know why they didn't have American food, but we got used to British rations and then they shipped us down to Sh Shrewsbury, down on the coast. And uh, I met up with some British families and uh, was screened by the Episcopal Church to meet these young women. I've always wondered if that was a compliment or an insult that, that they said it was all right for me. To, uh, anyway, a woman that I met, a young woman, was from medical school and she was home on vacation. And Jean and I struck up a good friendship. And uh, it wasn't any romance, fortunately. But we'd go horseback riding and I'd get some good food in the afternoon over her house. 
we kept up a correspondence, and we still correspond. And my wife and I visited with her and her husband uh, a few years ago, and uh, we got a letter from her a couple of weeks ago. It was just she, her husband died, but both of them finished medical school. Uh, anyway, <coughs> our pilots, well, when we were against horseback riding, we'd ride up through the hills near out in the country. And there were a lot of Canadian troops up there, and they were the ones that did the Dieppe invasion. I always, well, they called it a raid. I thought it was a probe to see what they, if they could go in there and stay. And that was some of the first real active combat that our pilots saw. And it's devastating just a few days later to see those guys coming back all beat up and the equipment. It was just a horrible orientation to what war could really be like. And after a few weeks at the air base outside of Shrewsbury, we boarded up. Didn't know where we were going, but we got on the ship and uh, went up through the, uh, I, the IRC again and got sick right away because, boy, that is a rough one. And didn't know where we were, had no clue. And then while the convoy assembled, I never seen so many ships in my life. I guess at that time, it was one of the biggest convoys ever assembled. And uh, it we was still 1942. Yeah, June of 42. June. Well, it was the fall of 42 before the invasion of North Africa, which I guess what was October or November. And it kept all kinds of rumors where we were going. And uh, I mean, it, it, the boat we were on uh, had been converted to a troop ship. It was the HMS Bhutan, and it. It was about as smelly as that name, and uh, the food was horrible, and and the conditions, uh, we had to dump the food at night out, out of big buckets that had been slopped around. God, maybe I can see it now going up the steps all messy from food, and we'd sit in line all day long uh, waiting to get into the ship stores to buy cans of fruit and stuff from South Africa, and that helped survive going to the, on the convoy to Africa. And of course, I didn't realize the danger of, of uh, submarines and things at that point. So they did, had not briefed you on submarine? Oh, no, we don't have any idea where we'll go or what we're going to do. And of course, after uh, a week or 10 days, it seemed like, while well, uh, we, with the invasion of North Africa and my outfit, I was in the headquarters squadron, uh, and we went in at our zoo, which is just up the coast from Oran. And I can remember being on that shipboard that night with all field gear and a submarine, I mean a, a Thompson submachine gun, and I really thought I was a soldier. And uh, I thought, man, I, I'm going up tonight. They climbed over, you know, on a rope ladder thing and, and wait for the landing craft to come up to the right place and jump in. And we went into the shore, and there wasn't much opposition coming in. There were snipers, and they were French. This was in NRZ on a, at the dock. And of course, if we is where? in North Africa, just down the coast from Oran. Okay. <coughs> uh, it, it, it made a lasting impression on me about the French, because they were French soldiers shooting at us. I thought, well, we're on your side. We're here to rescue you. But of course, they'd been ordered to, to fire at us, and uh, they did. We had typical army kind of thing. The trucks were coming in from ships after daybreak. And they were loaded down with field kitchens. But at that time, you didn't need field kitchens. You needed ammunition and gasoline. So we had to unload those trucks on the docks with some minor type of fire. It wasn't all that heroic, but we were getting shot at. And unloading those cans of gas, and I mean, putting the cans of gas on, taking the stoves off and stuff. And uh, then I remember there was huge barrels of wine on the dock. Well, it didn't take us long to discover it. I was a little leery because I thought it might be wine for alcohol that could kill you. So we got into it and dumped our water out and drinking that wine out of the dock and got a little light. And uh, I remember this old uh, major, and we called him Mother. He was a real nice old guy, but he came up, boy, now you better hold that water because it's got to last for a few days. And I thought, Major or Mother, that, that water's been gone for a long time. This is wine. We're having a good time. Well, then we marched out to this hillside, and we were told to dig holes, you know, ditches to get into if we needed to because there should be some sniper fire. We were too long after this so World War I biplane came over and shoot that. And we laid him down a whole line of fire. 
and uh, I can remember one of the scariest times of my life because I was cleaning my submachine gun afterwards, and I guess I was tired and and ill prepared for that kind of experience. So I started to let the boat slide down. Well, you don't let the boat slide down on a submachine gun like you would a 22 rifle. And I had friends stand up close to me. And scared they did with I could have killed half a dozen guys. Some sergeant comes running over with his 45. Who did that? I said, I did. He said, you do that again and you'll not have a firearm for the rest of the war. And I thought, my God, imagine going through the war without a gun. One ten minutes later, he did the same one thing, cleaning the chamber, firing it. So anyway, and a few days later, we were out to the air base. I can't remember the name of it, but the paratroopers had landed there. And don't you know there were a couple of paratroopers sitting at the opposite ends of a slit trench? <coughs> One of them had cleaned his rifle just like I had, and stood the boat back and killed his buddy down at the end. Well, needless to say, it really trained me to be careful with firearms for the rest of the war. I know we had uh, Master Sergeant Durr. He was the meanest man alive, it seemed like. And he had been injured a little bit on the invasion on a truck. One firearm, so he just had gotten injured. And we were kind of hoping he'd never come back to us. But he did after about three or four days. <laughs> uh, anyway, we went on from there. Now, what was your role? Now, I, I was a radio operator, but until we got set up in the field, didn't do anything but just kill time. Uh, <coughs> then our pilots were making some flights uh, there outside of uh, our zoo or that. But we had a few days of just kind of sitting around. And then by then, it's getting close to Christmas, I guess. They put us on uh, transport planes and took us up as near as they could to the front, up near Catherine. At that time, <clears throat> the Patton was pushing us back. Up near where? Excuse me? Up near, you said up near where did you move? Uh, up, we moved up north toward into Tunisia. Okay. Near Catherine Pass and Thalep and those infamous places. And I remember landing at night in a plane and we had to carry all our gear and stuff. I, of course, I had more than I needed. I had two barracks bags full of junk and a musette bag and gun and all kinds of personal junk. And we stayed in uh, French soldier tents, round things in a concrete base. And uh, God, when I get to talk about this, it really does come back more than I want it to. And so then they put us on trucks the next day or two and headed up. But word was that we were retreating. And that was scary as a dickens. And, but I think some British troops uh, had then to kind of cut things off and save us. And we went into this base that was, you know, just landing strip with metal strip thing. Uh, it was near Catherine Pass. We thought of it, I thought of it as Catherine. And uh, I've got some pictures of a hole on the side of the hill that I slept in. And uh, there was one that was a, that some of the guys had to slip by eight guys. There was a huge hole with timbers over it and so on. It was really luxurious compared to the hole that I had with one other guy. And uh, we had a big hole in the ground with a tent over it and camouflage stuff. That's where the radio station and uh, uh, switchboard for telephones were set up. And uh, we were there for oh, several days and then had to retreat overnight and packed up and left there. And you know, I was worried about getting captured because I sure didn't want to be a POW. And we were getting some aerial stuff, but we were close enough to the front because the Spitfires had a short range that you could hear the cannon fire a lot heavy at night. Well, they wasn't getting our field or anything, but the, the Jerry's would come over and drop some bombs, and I remember there were some of those butterfly bombs in the field that I had to go from the radio station to my hole in the wall, or in the ground. Well, a good bit of that time, I wasn't doing any radio work, because I figured it, as I understood it, that as soon as you got on the air, the Germans would know where you were, so we were on the switchboard. And I remember our code name for the headquarters was Upset. Upset operator, and I think there were times I really was. <laughs> and the other, the squadrons, there were three, at least three squadrons, 309, 308, and 307, I think. 
and one of them was Upton, and I never had been ill. They were all up something. Upton and upset, the only ones I can remember. Well, we, we were right out of that, that castering place uh, by the retreat and went up to another air base, and I can't remember the name of it for sure, but we were there for several days, and I can remember we'd, the dealings with the Arabs, the thing, the thing we have with the Arabs now. Why are the Arabs hostile to us? Because if you go down the road, they give you the arm, uh, and I thought, well, they must like the Germans and not like us. They didn't like anybody that was white, I guess. <coughs> and I guess they had justification for it historically, uh, but at any rate, we would buy eggs and oranges from them. But they were, they were somewhat Antagonistic. They were, and I just couldn't understand it because I thought we hadn't done anything to them. We're here to free them up and take the Germans off their back. But at any rate, uh, the, the African campaign seemed like it kind of drug on for a long time. And <coughs> did, did these Arabs speak any English at all? Enough to say your eggs and oranges. And uh, we were warned be careful about even buying eggs. It could be booby trapped. Well, I ate, well, they, that was really good food to eat the eggs. Or I can remember eating them with peanut butter and uh, jelly and all kinds of egg omelets from buying those eggs from the, and, and enough, enough oranges to make your orange, your, your urine turn orange. If, and, uh, Anyway. Did you get into any of the towns there? Got into Oran and, uh, a few times, but that was before we went on up to the front. Didn't get into any really towns much when we were up toward the front. Uh, although there was one, I got some pictures of uh, socializing with, uh, uh, they were Jewish people and had children and, uh, you know, it was always nice to relate to little kids. And uh, yeah, here's a picture of uh, Jerry, one of my radio operator friends, uh, with some children on his lap. Hold that up, yeah. And I don't know what the name of that town was, uh, but I think it was somewhere up in Tunis. Okay. And uh, when the, the Germans started to fold uh, in Tunis, and uh, we were set up to Cape Bond. That was the last, and you could see there were a lot of German prisoners that were marching out of the area that, that we'd taken over. They capitulated at that point. <coughs> And I remember that they, they told us that we were going to be safe because the nearest airplanes were in Sicily or Italy. And uh, so we didn't dig any holes to get into any, any slip trenches or anything. And about the second or third morning, you know, about six or eight German planes came over and started strafing that whole area really to a fairly well. Uh, <clears throat> Did you, did you lose any people? Yeah, we did. We lost a few that morning. I don't think anybody in headquarters lost because we were off from the squadrons. Uh, and there were some Canadians in the Air Sea Rescue that got killed that morning. And there was no anti aircraft or anything to protect us. And the pilots couldn't get into the air because we were under attack early morning. And I'll tell you, by late afternoon, as far as you could see, anti aircraft was being pulled in there. And we, didn't, of course, didn't have any more attacks. Uh, we stayed there for several days before they uh, shipped us to, I think it was Brazil, uh, on the coast of, of I don't know, Tunis, or, or must be Tunis, to prepare for the invasion of Sicily. And uh, I remember we, we put our pup tents, cooked them together, right up on the very top of this hill, and uh, stayed there. And there were German air raids that night, that night, several nights, on the harbor. No danger to us, but it was ex scary and exciting to, because all the anti-aircraft that was going up were trying to protect the harbor from the attacks of the planes. And uh, then my, out my squadron, or the headquarters, uh, I think it was D plus two. We'd gone in on D1 in North Africa, it was D plus two, I think, for Sicily. And uh, it wasn't all that hairy or anything then. So You were now leaving Africa and going into your Going into the invasion of Sicily. And uh, What was the situation in Africa when you left, when you, when you shipped out? Well, it was dirty and cold and that, <laughs> but uh, and oh, a lot of it, we had some German and Italian equipment. The Italians, incidentally, were never very frightening to us. I can remember one time in uh, one of the airstrips that we were stationed at for a while in North Africa, 
you could see Italians from there, but they weren't bothering us, we weren't bothering them. Uh, <clears throat> was by the end of the African campaign. I, I, somewhere in there, the Italians had capitulated. Uh, but that must have been after we were in Sicily. Uh, I remember we, was, we had uh, a landing strip was right down on the coast, and we were, had our bivouac thing up on the side of this mountain like in, in Sicily. And I can remember one time, a bunch of our guys had gotten terribly out of uniform, had Hawaiian shirts on and shorts, and they'd gone in this little town <coughs> to get water for the truck, truck water, full of water. And Patton spotted them and pulled them off the truck and gave them a summary court martial right then and there. So he had been pretty hard on the GIs in, in Africa, particularly Air Force guys that had cotton uniforms that were cooler, and he made us all wear wool, and wear those little putties that wool were worn things. But, uh, I remember the only time that I really did anything maybe stupid, uh, another guy from Oklahoma and I were hitchhiking to Palermo the morning that Patton slapped a soldier in the tent. And an ambulance truck picked us up hitchhiking and told us about it. And boy, well, that report on Patton just went all over that island just instantaneously. Uh, well, then we uh, lined up to, or got ready after a while to, uh, for the invasion of Italy and went in at Salerno. And uh, we didn't know about D1 plus 2. I know it wasn't D Day. But they didn't have much beachhead, and the Germans were really active there. They poured a lot of. Now, when would this have been? That would have been in the sp early spring of '43. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I can remember there. That we were there was a heavy bombardment very near us, and our planes a lot of times couldn't fly because of bombardment. And we were. Told that we might have to evacuate. Not well, this would be like another Dunkirk. Where are we going to evacuate to? The Mediterranean? Uh, well, as it turned out, we didn't have to, but it was kind of scary. Uh, and I can remember pulling guard duty one night and uh, was walking around and I saw these eyes and I, I gave it the challenge and no response. So I let loose. It was uh, reflected from the uh, like on a, on a watch, on a, a Jeep dashboard. I killed the Jeep dashboard. <laughs> but uh, at that time, there were paratroopers dropping that kind of stuff, so you really were trigger happy. And uh, what was it like when you actually were going from the landing craft to the beach? Was there was there a well, we were, fire then? Or? No, we weren't under fire, so it wasn't all that scary. Now it had been a little bit in Africa, uh, but and it was D plus two in Sicily, so it wasn't then. Uh, in fact, uh, Sicily, it wasn't a landing craft; it was an LST. Oh. And uh, I remember that. That was quite an experience because we'd been on British troop ships before that. This was an American troop ship, and I can remember getting on that LST in Africa and getting into the kitchen and taking a, a stick of butter and eating it like ice cream. Because all we had was that army oleo, and that oleo wouldn't even melt at 110 degrees. So that, that, that stick of butter was very tasty. Uh, we, in the, the, we got into Italy, and uh, we still had the Spitfires, so we had to, that meant that the landing strips for the Spitfires had to be fairly close to the front because of the short range. Then we uh, took over uh, Italy, was Naples fell, and they stationed us at, uh, I want to say it was Palmiano, but that might not be the time. It's where they made the Alfa Romeo cars, Alfa Romeo old cars. Uh, and it had the last strip there, and, and the factory had been bombed, the heck and gone. And they put us, bivouacked us, in a apartment like. And that was pretty neat getting off the floor and off the dirt and stuff. And, uh, but it also had civilians in those parts. And every night, the Germans would come over and they, they'd sight on Vesuvius, which was in the background, to circle around from the Naples Harbor to bomb, shoot up Naples Harbor ships and things. And I think in some ways that was the hardest part of the war to me because of the 
civilians, and you'd, ha you'd help them to evacuate from the floor down into bomb shelters in the bottom of that apartment house. And you'd, they screaming and crying and children and stuff. It just, it was really unnerving as it could be. And it was anti aircraft uh, stuff right outside. That's fine. And you didn't know what was a bomb and what was anti aircraft. So we'd help some of the crippled people down into their shelters. And then I'd come on back up because I didn't want to stay down there with all the crying and reverberation. It wasn't as scary up there on the ground watching stuff as it was down there. Uh, were, they, were these civilians uh, friendly, unfriendly? Or just they were friendly. I, I remember there was one older lady, and uh, she was just real sweet. She gave me a, a coin that I've got now that, God, it's big around as a huge thing, and it, I don't know what the date is, and it's, it's the date's worn out. But it, it's a really ancient relic that she gave to me. But she would always, really, if things got excited, she'd say, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. And I'd get after her for using Jesus Christ. Because uh, to me, I thought it was, you know, Jesus Christ, you just don't say that. But to her, it was religious for a prayer. I wonder what, that, what happened to the old lady. But uh, there were some cripples in there that you'd have to take down in chairs into the bomb shelter. We went down several flights to get to the shelter, and then several flights down in that. Uh, but it was pretty swanky compared to living in a tent in the dirt. Uh, but then it, I, it must have been about there. The next base that they sent us up to was near, I think, the Volturno River. Uh, it was all up a few miles north of Naples. And they switched us over from the Spitfires to P-51s. Well, that's where you start having to shine your shoes. Up until then, we'd been treated like dirt soldiers. And, you know, you didn't have to worry about uniform and shoe shines and that kind of thing. But with P-51s, we were well enough back behind the lines that uh, discipline started to set in. And uh, we were still, we were in tents and up off the ground. And a radio station was set up. They, at that point, along with the P-51s came a bread, what we call a bread truck. It was a panel truck with uh, radios and a big transmitter in it. And we were in hog heaven. There was a heater in that truck and uh, had two receivers, one that you used to monitor the net uh, and report in, and one that we listened to access Sally. And, uh, from Tokyo? Yeah, from Berlin. Oh, Berlin, okay. Yeah. That's Tokyo Rose was Tokyo. Did you, did, were you able to hear her too? Or no, no, just access Sally, because it was loud and clear and, and good, good music. And uh, she had a very lilting voice, and of course she'd tell us, when, when we went in, by the way, she would, announced things about some of our pilots by name. And so, yeah, it was kind of frightening. And they went on and through the war. She talked about the 31st Fighter Group because it was quite an outfit. Uh, I was proud to be a member of it. Uh, I've got a picture of Colonel Hawkins. He was a commanding officer when we went over. He knew he moved on up and became General Hawkins. But, uh, I know he, he had made us have mixed feelings about him when he kept bragging about he was going to take the 31st around the world. Well, I didn't want to go around the world. I wanted to go home. <laughs> uh, in, in fact, the 31st was scheduled to go to the P uh, Pacific after the war, but they didn't. I think they came on back and then, uh, or st for a long time, they had us during peacetime, the 31st fighter group was stationed somewhere in Italy. When you had bread trucks, um, were, how close were you to the front lines then? By then, we were well back. It was safe as could be. Of course, you could always get shot at an airplane or something, but they didn't. And uh, I don't remember us a raid after we had the bread truck. Uh, and it was very comfortable, uh, although in some ways, taken back, it was sure a standby. Kind of, there wasn't critical communications that we were sending. I say my radio buddies now, I'm a ham radio operator, so I'm think I must have been sending important messages. Uh-uh, it was, anything important was going by teletype or telephone, and uh, what type of messages were you sending? What type of communication? Just enough for practice of, I, th I think there were encoded sick reports and, th you know, stuff that, that could be sent by a new train. It didn't make it, wasn't that important. And after a while, you kind of knew it wasn't all that important, but it made you think you were doing something. And we had some communication with Navy ships. I always hated that because they had what you call a bug. And instead of having a straight key, which is all we ever had, where did I, did it, not it, there's a 
<laughs> hard as they think of something. Because I had passed 25 words a minute code in school, but I was doing well to do 15 and 16 words a minute. I'm doing well to do 18 now. I sure wouldn't do 25. And so we hated those paddles that the Navy had. I think every sailor that was a radio operator must have had a, a bug paddle. <laughs> they, uh, things, by then, things were slowing down for us. They still worked for the GI, the infantrymen in, in, North, in Italy. But uh, I remember getting a pass, three-day pass, I guess it was, to Rome. And uh, there's one of, the, one of the guys that was in cryptography, and I went up there, and he wrote a good report about the trip to Rome. And uh, my my daughter, my middle daughter, just came back with her from uh, with she and her husband were in Italy and, and went to Rome and uh, places there that I'd been, and uh, it was kind of interesting her experience. What, what was your experience in Rome? What did you think of being? A well, uh, first I guess it's hard to believe. I had an audience with the Pope, along with a few hundred other. GIs. I'm not Catholic, but my sister's Catholic, and I'd gotten a, a beaded rosary that I held up for, as he went down blessing stuff. And of course, there was every kind of soldier imaginable in there being with this audience with the Pope. They brought him in on a chair, you know, and uh, he was blessing everybody. And they were Russian. The first time I saw any Russian soldiers. And uh, it's been the same buddy of mine, and I had a few days pass in uh, Capri. And uh, that was interesting. Got into the Blue Grotto. And that was the only place that I heard anybody defending Mussolini. Some woman in the shop, I can remember, in, in uh, Capri, talked about he was not all bad, that he did make the trains run on time, and I've heard that subsequently. <laughs> but, uh, and and uh, we had a Catholic priest that uh, he wasn't all that much with me, but he did take groups of guys up to climb Vesuvius. Day after day, a week after week in there, so I climbed a good bit of Vesuvius with him. And uh, but uh, I can remember, well, off the record, <laughs> a bunch of us were sitting around in the room one night, and everybody was saying, you know, what does my name mean to, to a Catholic priest? And they you know, John, and he did, and I said, what about Ross? He said, you're a heathen. <laughs> that kind of hurt my feelings. <laughs> Attached to your unit? Yeah, he was a chaplain at the time. Yeah. And certainly did a lot for the guys, taking them. It must have really gotten him in good shape climbing the Vesuvius because it wasn't easy to climb with a, you'd take one step forward and two backwards in that uh, ash like stuff that would sell. And he also took us to, uh, and that may be the Pomigliano that pops up. It's not Vesuvius, I mean uh, Pompeii. He thought that the other town, must have been Pomigliano, was. But there's a real thing for, you know, so we, I didn't get to Pompeii. I went to the other town that was buried in one of the uh, Vesuvius things. So you were able to see the, the remnants of that? The, the oh gosh, yes. How long were you in that location? Well, we were there for what well, seemed like forever by then because by then there were a few guys getting rotated back. I'd been overseas, you know, for three years, or not three years, but two years, six months, and ten days, or something like that. That was about the 30th month. And, uh, so we were in the 1944 by now. Right. And was this before D-Day? Yeah. The, the Normandy Yeah, it was in January or February. Okay. It, it was a matter of fact, it was right after I came back from that trip today to uh, Capri. Okay. Got off the truck, I said, Rush, you lucky son of a gun, you're going home, but I couldn't believe it. I knew some of my buddies that when they were put on rotation to go home, they went to bed. They, they were so scared they'd fall and break a leg. <laughs> that, uh, uh, but uh, then I, I really was pleased. Boy, I was happy to be going home. And uh, I can remember, of course, you were leaving, leaving all your buddies that you'd been with for months and months overseas and into a consolidation point in Naples. And I can remember. It was cold as a dickens. That must have been. It was in January, February. Cold as a, and then these tents that were unheated. And uh, I remember one guy cracked up. He was hallucinating that the tent was on fire. I don't know who he was or whatever happened to him, but he was really over the hill. And uh, then we 
finally, after a few days, and uh, some more shots, I guess, put us on a troop ship uh, for the States. That's the first time I'd ever been on an American troop ship, uh, a full size one, besides the LSTs. And uh, what a treat. I, I'd been sick on those other ships. You didn't get sick on that one because it was good food and you could keep yourself stuffed with crackers and stuff. Well, now, when you were, they were sending you home, were they sending you home for further training to fly no. in? Or, or That's what they thought of it. They said it was the third day furlough uh, en route. For, so I went to visit with them. By that time, my mother had moved to West Virginia from Illinois and was working at a college, Bethany College, up in West Virginia. So I was there, and it was quite a transition, more than I would have thought it would be, coming back from overseas, and 32 months overseas, and I, I, I felt a little paranoid, like people were looking at me, and uh, I didn't have to get hospitalized, but I was really kind of spooky about all these people, because a lot of people were knew, me, knew my mother there in a little college town, and uh, I had the 30 days there, I went on a train. Yeah, I'd gone through 32 months overseas and on a train from Wellsburg or Steubenville, Ohio, West, West Virginia, one or the other, on the way to Florida. It was crowded on the train and I had finally gotten a seat about one or two o'clock in the morning and the darn train jumped the track. And I'd grown up where there were trussels and I thought, what if we're on a trussel? <laughs> and here I've come through the war essentially unscathed and now I'm going to get killed in a train. Well, I didn't, of course. Went on to Miami. And they were putting us up in really neat little hotels in Miami Beach. And they were running you through all kinds of tests. And, uh, but they had a list on a bulletin board about guys who'd been there for their 30 days and were going to the Pacific Theater. And I thought, not this boy. I sure didn't want anything in the Pacific. So I filled out the questionnaire. Did you feel like people were watching it? Oh, yeah. You know, did you have trouble with your family? Yeah. <laughs> did you think I could make myself look like a nut? I was going to put down there. Well, darn it, if they didn't examine me, found I had impacted wisdom teeth. They sent me to the hospital to have my teeth pulled. <laughs> well, while I was there, of course, I, uh, I, I took a bunch of tests, and which became the equivalent of a, almost a whole semester of college. And so there was a good deal to be there in the convalescent hospital. And I did take up some hobby things. I, I remember I've got a lamp that I made out of plastic that is kind of a modern looking thing. And I've got some oil paintings that I did there in the hospital. So it was a fairly decent layover. But I sure did. They pulled one tooth at a time. So it took a long time to get there. And uh, you know, I remember my grandmother died while I was there, and they shipped me home for a few days for that. I remember getting bumped off an airplane somewhere in Georgia at the time. I was on my way to Tennessee before I finally got home. And uh, let's see. Now, this was still before the Normandy invasion. This was before. No, no, that was, see, I came in January. Yeah, that, that was, by golly. Uh, and then, uh, but I, so I went back to the hospital for more teeth to be pulled. So I was dragging a lot of time out of that one. And uh, then the, uh, the Japanese thing, and I know that was a, even more exciting than D-Day, or the, the end of VE Day in Europe, because that was, then that was it. And I wasn't any chance of my being shipped overseas again. Uh, so then they shipped us to a consolidation center from Florida, somewhere in South Georgia, and put us up, a whole bunch of us that didn't know each other, but they put us up in what had been POW barracks and forgot us. Because somehow in the administration of things in the Army, that consolidation thing had been done away with on paper. But there we were. And we sat there for days, and you know, the food wasn't all that bad. The barracks weren't all that bad, but they had been POW camps. And it just it didn't seem right to be stuck in a prisoner of war camp. So finally, we got together, and we were very careful because we knew we didn't want to be charged with rebellion or anything. But we marched on the Inspector General's office there, at that, wherever that base was. 
and sent in our representatives to tell him well what the situation was. Well, fortunately, they didn't put us in jail or shoot us for desertion or something. But by night, they had put us into permanent quarters. Decent started writing orders for to send us to discharge centers. Now, well, was the war still going on then? No, the Japanese, the everything was over. Yeah, that was the frustrating part. Yeah, the war was over, and we were stuck at this base and like forgotten troops. So you were you were back in the States for about a year or so? Well, I was back for about six months. Six months? Yeah, from January or February, somewhere in there, must have been, till September. Actually, the war was over. September 45? Yeah. And that's 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 when I came home, January forty five, not forty four. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you were still in Europe when right. you, during the Normandy invasion. Right. Okay. That, exactly. Yeah, that, okay. I, I slipped again because no, we were scheduled to go into southern France. Okay. But they met so little air opposition. This is what I was told. They didn't ship us there. They left oh, us in Italy. Okay. Uh, now they sent one of our squadrons went to Anzio. And we were scheduled to go in there, but thank God they didn't, because they had them pinned down, they couldn't fly, and they didn't shoot in any radio up there. So we didn't go there, as you know, we stayed there at that last base that I was on. And uh, the only injury I got, we were pulling a frame off of a door where the radio room was, with the old building, and I pulled a crowbar into my head. I've still got a scar. <laughs> I, I bled like I'd been shot. <laughs> But, uh, so you were you were in Italy till about January of '45. That's it. Yeah. Came home. Okay. Yeah. It, it all passes fast when you're having fun. Right. <laughs> you're remembering a lot of detail. This this is wonderful. Well. So, so you were. Okay. Uh, we. They, they sent us by then. Sent me to Camp Atterbury. Well, by then there were guys that were coming through with 65 and 75 points, you know, for getting out. You know, so many points. You, well, I had 135, 140 from the time I'd been overseas and stuff. So here these others were getting out with 65 points. Well, I got out, of course. I remember they giving me a chance to, to enlist in the reserves or something. I no way I wanted any more of the Army. So I went from from that, from Camp Atterbury, back to Bethany College, and then enrolled, and I got there almost in time for enrollment, but I was a little late, but I still enrolled and, and had to take some extra classes and stuff uh, for orientation to college, and that's where I entered college, and thanks to the good old GI Bill, I did a bachelor's degree at Bethany in sociology with a minor in psychology, and then I did a master's in social work. I had enough months left over because of that time that I'd <coughs> made up taking those tests in the hospital. I didn't have to, I had, that got me one quarter, and then I went to summer school, so I was eager to get on through college. And of course, when I was a, a beginning junior, because uh, I didn't really, wasn't really ever a junior, I was a freshman, a sophomore, and then a senior. Uh, I met my bride, and uh, no more women for me then. I just my bride, Fern, and I really hit it off. And uh, the, the June of of uh, 45, I guess it was, 46, 46 I graduated in 48, 47, 47, I married Fern from Toledo, Ohio. She was there as a ministerial student, and I convinced her that I was a full-time conversion effort on her part, that she could work on me for a long time. They worked. They worked <laughs> for, for all these years. We got a son, or some boy, a daughter that's 40, 55, and a son 54, a daughter 50, and a daughter 46. Congratulations. And two grandchildren. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> I want to ask you a question. When, when you overseas, in Africa and Italy, yeah. did, did you realize you were part of one of the most significant events in world history? In some ways, I knew, I thought we were doing something that was right, fighting Hitler and his regime. Uh, I, I was, after a while, I was awful homesick at times. I sure got tired of the war. I got tired of, of being there and wondering, when am I going to ever get home? Because I'd look around and there were other guys a lot older than me, and a lot of guys that were married and had children, they needed to go home before I did. So I thought, well, when will I ever get home? <laughs> but uh, I was proud of, of being a part of it. 
Uh, of course, I always hark back to that night of the invasion in North Africa. <laughs> I know guys went through a whole lot worse than I did, but I really felt that I was doing something then. And I wasn't scared particularly. I, I wasn't, wasn't happy to be here in gunfire or cannon fire and stuff. But uh, it took me a long time to give to forgive the French. And it always seemed to me in North Africa like every French soldier had his own Jeep and they'd never pick you up when you're hitchhiking. The British would, the Polish would, uh, any other troops would pick you up. On the but it seemed to me like French didn't. Now that may have been a real American or Richardson distortion, but it seemed that way. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> you brought some medals with you. Could, could you? Well, there's nothing all that personal, but uh, there was a European theater, and on the victory medal, it was a good, good, good uh, combat medal. My kids laugh about that one. This was the presidential citation medal with an Oak Cliff cluster given to our, uh, the 31st Fighter Group. This is a medal that came from the Russians because our pilots flew support for the uh, tankers that were going over there, or bombers and stuff, going to bomb the Palesti oil fields. So any outfit that had any support of the Russian conflict was awarded this medal uh, after the war. And it was a letter that came with it from some high fire powered Russian uh, that said who the who the president then, or the, anyway, he had told him to give us this medal. Uh, the uh, Malta also issued a medal, but I, I didn't know about it in time to apply for it. <laughs> Our saw pilots were stationed in Malta for a while and flew some support for Malta. Uh, well, I've, I don't have very many good pictures, but I had some that, uh, I had one, Eddie Rickenbacker came by with a Goodwill tour for. Do you have that there? Uh, I think I may have a. And we're going to make some copies of the, uh, some of those pictures for the. This is that woman that I met in England that uh, I still correspond with. Uh, I just saw a picture of. A, a, Where is it? Show us the woman that you met in England that you talked about. She was in medical school, and she had a, she later married another doctor, and my wife and I visited with him a few years ago, and uh, really had an enjoyable visit, and we just got a letter from Jean last week. Uh, I, I don't yeah here's that picture. I don't know who this was, some air marshal or something that was talking to our pilots, and uh, this was a picture of me and in uh, the town just outside of Naples, where the Alfa Romeo factory is. Uh, this is an old Georgian. I, don't, I haven't heard anything from him. I don't know anything Bill Gibbs, I remember his name. And there's uh, one of our tents. I'll show that up here in the camera. There. That was a, we were stationed there briefly, just outside of uh, Oran or Zoo. There was a French army barracks. Uh, yeah, would you show the certificate of merit that you've got? Down yeah. There? We're going to have that oh. here also. I want to get it on. Yeah. There. This tells the different campaigns that I my outfit was in. Uh, Battle Star for Algeria, French Morocco, Tunis, Sicilian, Naples, Fugia, Rome, Arno, an Air European Offensive in southern France, the 8th Air Force, the 12th Air Force, the 15th Air Force. Uh, it says here special achievements that I was a high speed radio, radio operator in charge of the station. Now that was news to me when I got this certificate. I never thought I was in charge of anything. Uh, there was another picture of that. Oh, we've got some pictures of shot down airplanes. And, and, uh, yeah, we'll make some pick copies of those and put okay. them here. That, that'll be real interesting to people that are come to see the various artifacts. And this is a picture here of Ike Valentine. He was another old Tennessee boy. And uh, I've got a picture of Ike here shoveling dirt. <laughs> He didn't like that because he thought he was really something. He was a big gambler. Oh, yeah, there you go. 
Yeah. And Ike would win a lot of money, and he didn't want the guys to come to him borrowing from him or wanting to gamble more, so he'd let me carry his money for him. Uh, I hadn't kept up with Femi. I had, there was one radio operator, uh, Porky Porkoff in Pennsylvania, and Porky and I corresponded, and for years we'd get Christmas cards, and everything was all underlined several times, and my kids would get a kick out of that. Well, then finally Porky died, and his wife sent us a Christmas card, and they were all underlined. If I wanted it was his wife, it was all underlined. <laughs> But, uh, and then his daughter kept correspondence with me for a long time, and she was a younger woman, but she died about a year ago, so I, I've lost contact with, with the Porkoffs. Well, I want to thank you just personally, and also on behalf of the History Center and Library of Congress for what you did for the country. I mean, well, you, were, you were a hero just being been, over there and doing that's what I've been thinking of myself as any hero. I know you, you are to us. <laughs> Well, you were too, if you were in them. Is there anything else you would like to uh, say about your experiences in World War II? Well, I guess it's hard to be grateful for war, but I'm grateful for the GI Bill, for sure. I think it did more for this country than any other single piece of legislation, practically. Well, because it gave me opportunity for an interesting career. I worked in family, well, I worked with disturbed children for a while with the masters in social work and did marriage counseling. And uh, eventually went to work full time in Planned Parenthood or family planning. Uh, came south in 64 to organize clinics all over the south and had a great deal of success with that. Eventually went to work for Governor Carter as the director of the special council on family planning in Georgia. He was very supportive. As his mother was on my council, Miss Lillian. And uh, then when it was getting into his lame duck year, uh, I got a call from the chairman of the Department of Gynecology and Obstetrics at Embry. He said, Russ, I want you to come over and direct the training center. How about you coming to work for us? I said, oh, damn, I've done nothing but criticize the training center. He said, that, you're going to come over and straighten it up. And I did, and I stayed 16 years there and enjoyed it and really felt like we accomplished a lot. We worked a lot with public health people all over the South. And uh, I've got a wall full of plaques and things, uh, awards. Uh, but I, I was very active in family planning, helped to organize the uh, National Family Planning Reproductive Health Conference nationally, and served as president of that for a couple of terms. So I had a, a great career in family planning. I've had a good life with my wife and four children and the grandchildren. So uh, I, I've had a lucky, a good life. Well, you're, you're a good man, and we should appreciate everything you've done during, during, during the war and after the war. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you very much, and uh, we really appreciate you spending your time and sharing your story with us. You're very welcome. I hope it's worthwhile to the yeah, record. Definitely worthwhile.